Hey, I'm Rachel Abbott, and welcome back to the Standards Tech and Science Daily. If you're new here, make sure to give us a rating and a follow. US President Donald Trump has said that Chinese startup DeepSeek's technology should act as a wake-up call for American companies. Investors sold technology stocks across the globe on Monday over concerns the emergence of a low-cost Chinese artificial intelligence model would threaten the dominance of the current US-based AI leaders. We saw a very dramatic crash in the share prices of some of America's biggest tech companies. Shares in NVIDIA lost about nearly $600 billion of value, which is the biggest loss of value of any stock market quoted company in history. That's the London Standards business editor, Jonathan Prynne. Some other major tech stocks also got caught up, not as badly hit, but still fell fairly dramatically. And that dragged the whole of NASDAQ down. NASDAQ is the tech-focused stock market in America. NASDAQ was down about 3%. As Donald Trump said later in the day, it was a real wake-up call for the American tech sector. Is there really an American advantage in AI or are the Chinese right on our heels? Now, in this extended special of Tech and Science Daily, to explain his views on the rise of DeepSeek's R1 model, its significance and potential impact on industry, we're joined by Dr. Mark Kennedy, who leads the Data Science Institute at Imperial College London. Dr. Kennedy, to start, just briefly, could you let us know who is behind DeepSeek? So the interesting thing about who's behind DeepSeek is it's a small team. Smart people from China who previously were really a hedge fund and somehow pivoted to be a kind of research group that built this rather remarkable and novel expression of LLM technology, I'll put it that way. Um, it's a cool system. Very innovative. And could you explain the DeepSeek R1 model? At a super high level, I'm going to give you the kind of explanation that I would give my friends that are not reading all the papers. When LLMs were first introduced, they sort of did the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours of exposure. It's what the late great Danny Kahneman would have called fast thinking. You're exposed to a huge amount, you build up heuristics, and you know how to answer questions without a lot of deep reasoning. It was, as we all probably recall, incredible amazing, but it also did some really dumb things. And so people do dumb things when we use our fast thinking, when we should be using slow thinking. And mostly people have a decent ability to know when to switch between the two, but the early LLMs only had the one mode of thinking. The big difference between more recent generations of models, not just deep seek, I'll come to them in a minute. One of the big differences is getting slow thinking into the models. So for people who haven't come across Kahneman's kind of slow thinking, fast thinking uh, idea before, it's just this thing where you can reason from intuition, you can reason from learned patterns, reason in air quotes, or you can reason step by step by step by step by step um, and thinking through kind of what uh, people in AI call the chain of thought, like show your work, like back to you know GCSE maths or whatever it is that you did uh, in the way of maths, maybe you did A-levels, maybe you went on it and are a mathematician, but you know that in that world, it's really important, especially when you're learning to you show your work. These models do a kind of showing their work to themselves to talk them through how to learn where reinforcement learning is applied to that. So then in a way, they're building intuitions for how to reason. That's not exclusive to R1. But it's amazing that R1 has it and that they built it for the amount of money that they spent to build it. And here comes the really, you know, two things that, that make it stand out and are making everybody take notice. One is instead of, you know, maybe spending a hundred million on a team or more, uh, maybe a, a good fraction of a billion to build a team and build the compute resources to build a model like this. They did this for like 10 million with a really small team. And, and part of the way that they did that is by realizing that you can kind of fake up reasoning by prompt engineering. So if you used an old version of ChatGPT and you caught it making mistakes, you know that you could go back and you could say, by the way, I just noticed this and you could point out the mistake. And often it would go, oh gosh, yeah, you're right and fix it. 
but eventually learned through reinforcement learning uh, with human feedback. That's not a good thing to do. And so, so what's happening now is that that's kind of built much more into the process of building the model, not just left to the user. And that's you know the result of years of work on these models by everybody. The second thing that's really cool, which is this kind of bringing distillation to really the forefront of this, is you take this giant model that knows a ton of things and you say, gosh, that's pretty expensive both to build and use because it, it's got to do a lot of computations to give you an answer to your question. And you say, okay, let's, I only really need to know how to fix my leaky faucet. I just want to know about plumbing. Can we just take that part of what you know and put that in something that's smaller and faster and cheaper? They've done that and, and have their, their main model, but also distilled models that are small footprint. And you and I could go out and with money, we could reasonably raise or maybe even have in savings. We could buy the computing hardware that would run that and host it locally and apply it to a business model to solve a problem for somebody that would be potentially really helpful if we put that interface together and reach a customer that needs that knowledge in a way that it's kind of wrapped in a service model that people would go, that's cool. So like to recap that, from China, using we don't know what data, very small team, kind of came out of hedge fund background, but started doing AI, probably went and hired a bunch of really smart people. There are plenty of them in China. And, and used some techniques that were out there, but in a different way by, by going small rather than super large. And you know, I think this is something that people should be both concerned about and celebrate. Just on that last note you made, does this constitute a wake-up call for the likes of other generative AI models then? I mean, yes and no. Uh, you know, so people have known about distillation. People have known about the need for reasoning to be put into these models. Others have already done it. Uh, if anything, you know, the R1 model is not at the absolute cutting edge of these things, but it is at the cutting edge of like, do it small, do it cheap do it fast. That is the part to celebrate. Right? So the wake up call is not so much like, oh, your technological ideas were raw, but there was a, a, a kind of song sheet that the tech literati were singing from and selling hard to governments, uh, particularly in the West, which was, this is super dangerous. We should keep it confidential. We can't share it with anybody. And there are reasons to be concerned about the dangers. Don't get me wrong. But what that was leading to is, so we should be the only ones that have it. We just know from a business perspective that when anybody ever tells you that, grab your wallet, be concerned. You're vesting you know, monopolistic power over whatever good it is in people that you really are going to have to trust a lot. And that's, you know, that's risky. Uh, history says that's a very bad idea. And then when it's a power as transformative as AI, is that you know, any better of an idea just because there are some dangers? Maybe not. With these different models, from a cost perspective, do they run off the same power? No. I mean, that's one of the really revolutionary things about R1. And I should say, it will not take OpenAI or Google or Meta or, you know, any player that's, that's in this very long to say, oh, we have a really big model. We know about distillation. Why don't we you know, do what we see R1 having done very nicely, which is lean harder into distillation and give people the opportunity to kind of have carve outs from the big brain um, that is you know, like that plumbing expertise that we need or something that's more focused. That will use far less power to you know, do a query. It will be cheaper per query and also cheaper to train. The way that R1 was built was less money to train it, less power used, you know, that's why less money. And that is a big deal. That's a really big deal. Let's go to a quick break. Coming up. This is definitely an exciting time for entrepreneurially minded people who are thinking about the things that you could do with AI. There will be a lot that would be economically feasible with the innovations that R1 has combined. Welcome back. Dr. Kennedy, do the events of Monday surprise you? 
You know, I, the one thing that surprised me was how quickly markets figured out what this meant for certain tech stocks. I have the privilege of, you know, friends around the world who are looking at this stuff that we talk to each other. Thank you, friends. And so the chatter, you know, in the past week has been like, holy moly, I spend a good portion of my weekend watching videos and reading and understanding kind of, you know, signal chatting, all that kind of stuff. So by the time, you know, this came around, I was like, okay, this is going to be a big story on Monday. Let's see what happens. But I wasn't, uh, you know, I did not have a short position on the NASDAQ or on uh, in, NVIDIA. So, and I, and I think that that, that is a surprise, uh, but I, you know, sometimes I forget what I should have remembered and learned, which is that markets react very fast. And it does make sense given that people like me and others were studying this pretty hard that it shouldn't take too very long. You mentioned earlier that we were at risk of having too few models. So would you say the industry is at risk of crashing? The idea that there might be too many would be anchored in, well, surely some of them will be irresponsible. And some of them will be. And some of them may not just be irresponsible. They may have ill intent. So those are things to be concerned about because this, this is a powerful tool. But at the same time, if you're waiting on you know the good things that people could do with this to come out of like a centrally managed monopolistic resource, you might be waiting for a very long time. Governments around the world are looking at these technologies and saying, gosh, there's a lot of things that we provide as services to our citizens. There's a social contract that says we're going to do our best efforts to provide this service, especially if we're taxing you and making you pay for it, really. Are there ways that we could use some of these technologies to make that easier? I just had a conversation yesterday with the minister from Southeast Asia, I won't use names, uh, who's you know very concerned about these things. And you know, if you think about like how long will it be until it's easy to do something like, here's all my earnings, you probably know it anyway, bake my tax returns, please. I mean, that's doable now, but it's not high on the priority list for, you know, the people that are pushing the absolute frontiers of the technology. So having more players be able to do this cheaply just accelerates the rate at which everything that these systems are capable of doing gets picked up by some small team that says, hey, this is our niche. Let's go after We think we can do something that would really do something good. Uh, the flip side of that is that if you've got a half a dozen friends and you're all ne'er-do-wells and you've got enough money to put together some equipment and hide it in a basement somewhere, you can probably get up to some no good and, and do some damage. It's a yin and a yang thing type deal, which, you know, as ever. Um, so that's my concern is will we know how to, I suppose, chase the innovation with a rulemaking capacity that moves faster than what we've seen before. But will we be able to blend that vibe with one that says, gosh, we want the innovation. <laughs> we want these things to start to get to apply to the things that would be hassles for us that could be done more cheaply, more effectively, make your tax dollars go further, make the, the government budget, you know, for example, in the UK, think of everything that we could do administratively with the NHS that would help us get more care to people. That'd be amazing. Do you think tech companies will need to come together or does this just come down to different countries' own regulations? I don't really have a crystal ball on this. I think that there will likely be two different kinds of responses. You know, one which is kind of clamming up and seeing the dangers here and, and being very worried about that and maybe being fairly protectionist about encouraging developments locally. And another would be like, well, we would like to see this technology advance quickly and radically. So let's be part of pushing for that. I think that there was a contingent of, of innovators and regulators who were seeing, and I get this, they were seeing the advances that we've just witnessed as being so amazing, let's just, let's just gear in toward that. In the US, there was a vibe that was like that. We kind of know who the players are, let's back them and, and protect all this. And that we have to tear up that playbook and throw that away. So how do you respond to that? And how should other nations respond to that? And is that something where you get together and collectively do some things? 
where it's every person for themselves or every country for themselves, you know, to figure out how you do this. I suspect there will be alliances and there will be people who, and, and, and nations that kind of take similar approaches and that that will stand in distinction to others. We've lived in a world with the internet for 25 years where there's been kind of not just one internet, but in, you know, kind of more and more clearly sort of three versions of it. One that we see in places like China, where there's heavy restriction on what you can see. Another in places like Europe, where, um, and this is true for the UK as well, although not formally part of Europe anymore, during the years when all this was built up, the UK, of course, was part of the EU. And there you have data protections and you have kind of a, an ethos that says, we want to look at these technologies and not just let them run wild. And in the U.S., you tend to have a lot more power in the big tech companies and, and, and the startups that have become big tech companies saying, we think we know what to do with this and we should be trusted. So let's buy the law that we want. So those three different approaches are likely to kind of evolve and you know overlap a little bit, bleed into one another. But I don't see one approach and I don't think it's probably all that practical especially for a country that doesn't have a lot of money and already a lot of the you know smart people that that know these things to say well we just are going to do it our own way could a positive be that smaller companies could benefit from models such as deep seeks definitely at imperial this week we have an ai ventures class and there's a a big event this week where people are going to kind of have a go at developing business plans. And as you can imagine, that thing is hugely oversubscribed right now. Uh, this is definitely an exciting time for entrepreneurially minded people who are thinking about the things that you could do with AI. There will be a lot that would be economically feasible with the innovations that R1 has combined, which is, I, I hope I've, I've been saying this clearly, did not just originate with R1, but have been done more cheaply than what we've seen before by a factor of, say, maybe 10, which is amazing, you know, well done. And I think, like, that's something to celebrate and push <laughs> and apply to businesses and, and build things at great value. And that's Tech and Science Daily. For all the latest news, head to standard.co.uk. If you enjoyed this episode, please do hit follow and give us a rating.